Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Canadian Passive Investing Show. I'm your host, Ava Benasaki, and I'm joined by my co-host, August Benias. We have another great show for you today. If you could please like and subscribe as it helps us build our channel and allows us to keep bringing you great content and expert guest speakers. Our mission is to empower investors to earn passive income through real estate investing. Now, today we're joined by our good friend, Colm McEvely. A little bit about Colm, he attended the California Polytechnic State University and graduated with a bachelor's degree in engineering. Colm began his real estate investing career in single family properties and amassed a small portfolio of rentals. Colm transitioned into working for a real estate private equity firm as investor relations. Colm helped scale their investor relationship department and was instrumental in helping to raise over 65 million, which allowed the company to grow their portfolio from around 200 million all the way up to 600 million. Colm is now the founder, the co-founder of Iron Gall Investments, a real estate private equity firm focused on multifamily value add investments. Now, today we believe this interview will bring with, with Calm will bring great value to anyone looking to learn about investor relations of a real estate private equity firm. Welcome, our friend Colm. Welcome, Colm. Hey, I'm, I'm sorry my beard isn't up to your caliber, August, but I, I tried. <laughs> I <love laughs> your good looks make up for it, brother. That's all good. <laughs> and you can, you, you can still grow a great beard. A lot of people have issues with that. But yeah, yeah, excited to have you on here. Thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, please. Absolutely, Colm. Let's start off. Let's discuss your start in real estate investments. And if you could talk to us about your, experiencing, about your experience in purchasing your first property. Well, so that's pretty interesting because I was forced to. Um, oh, basically, okay. yeah, basically I, I was in a situation where I had a couple extra dollars on hand and, uh, there was, I was living in an apartment where there's some domestic violence above me and, um, and I had to get out. And so, um, because of the situation, I just, I, I don't know if this is really valuable for anybody, but, um, I think I was actually forced to become a, a renter, a, a landlord. Uh, and what happened there was I got a promotion and I relocated. So I wasn't forced to buy my first single family home, but um, about six months after buying my first single family home, I was promoted and had to relocate. And I didn't want to relinquish that purchase and that, that property. And so in that sense, I was forced to become a landlord. And that's what really started my journey is when I, and this was in 2013, I basically relocated. I had a significant um, pay increase because it was 100% commission. So I basically 4X my income in, in two years. And then, then I realized I would be working so much um, on this 100% commission sales job, yet every, every, you know, every month I just had this, this uh, income coming in from the rental. And so I just thought, that's kind of cool. And uh, how, can I, how can I increase it? It's kind of like an annuity with the stocks. And so I started buying single family homes every year until um, I relocated back to my hometown. Amazing, okay, amazing start. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Now, next, next question. I want, I want to talk about your transition into real estate private equity, aka syndication business. Um, how did you learn about real estate private equity and what excited you about it? Well, it's kind of funny. So I, I again, 100% commission you know, either you, you fly or you sink. And, uh, and there's so much freedom in that particular role that, that uh, you can basically hang yourself with the amount of rope that they give you. And so I was looking for something, I felt like a little bit, a little bit more certainty. And uh, you guys have an excellent podcast. Um, if, if anybody hasn't seen the Omar Khan episode, that's one of my, one of my favorites. You talk about, you know, the book you were super encouraging um, three months ago when you told me, or maybe even five months ago, when you told me about the book, Who Not How. And then coincidentally, Omar Khan in your episodes talking about that same book and how you, he bought it for all his peers and stuff. So um, check out that episode. But there was a different podcast, maybe in 2016, or 2017, and it was uh, Bill Manicero's Old Dog Podcast and Kim Lisa Taylor, the uh, syndication attorney. I actually might have her book right here, but um, she was at the best ever um, event, and uh, there was a, an hour long episode about her talking about what a, a syndication was. And I just thought that was so cool because at the time I thought I could only buy a single family home with my money or do a joint venture with with you know several of my high income, uh, you know, 100% commission friends. 
And so did you stumble upon this podcast? Was it just coincidental or were you searching and researching? Yeah, good question. Yeah, so I was I was driving quite a bit to meet some of the, the the clients. So basically I would work with healthcare facilities and industrial facilities on their their commercial cooling needs or or on their industrial cooling applications and and so some of, sometimes I would drive 5 hours in a day and I and I just thought okay, I my back hurts. I need to be entertained. So I, I stumbled ac across that podcast and, um, and it, some of them, some speak to you, some don't, you know, you know, but, uh, yeah. Got it. And, and then, so, so you're already in the real estate uh, investing space. You're already getting involved. You see the, 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 the power of real estate investing, and then you stumble on this podcast that describes what syndication model is and, and was, was it at that time that you realized that, Hey, I, I can actually raise capital, to then buy bigger projects, and and then what what were what were your next steps there there on? Well, I think I think the key differentiator was I learned in a hundred percent commission sales role with a very concrete structured company. You can't really leverage or scale. You know, everybody has twenty four hours in a day, and and the two things that I learned from the syndications is, especially on the commercial real estate side, is you can scale with partnerships, bringing other people's time in, and then you could scale with um, the loans. And, and when, and obviously you guys understand the difference between, to, between, you know, individual um, single family uh, residential home loans versus commercial loans. One of the projects we did was a $48 million uh, construction loan. There's no way I could individually qualify for that. Um, but through the syndication and through partnerships with, with the right developers and, and the investors and, on that project to help, I think we raised uh, 16 and a half million bucks. We, you could really scale a lot. And it's within that scale and that leverage that you create so much value, you know, assuming that the, you know, you, you execute the business plan according to the way it needs to be uh, operated. But um, yeah, it, it was interesting because it was real estate syndication on the commercial side that made me realize that I don't have to work 80, 90, 100 hours a week in order to make more money, I have to create systems. And so now when I, when I work, you know, obviously there's one-on-one -on -one investor calls, but there's other ways that we're going to talk about today of how can I scale my operations? What, what about automations? What about implementing systems? There's customer facing activities, or sorry, there's investor facing activities, and then there's non-investor facing activities. And what can I do to scale as much as I can on the non-investor facing activities? And, and we could talk about that today. For sure. Yeah, we got to get into that. We're here too. And, and Colm, we've known you for, for quite some time now. And the majority yeah. of the time we knew you, you actually worked, you were at, you were your investor relations for a really large real estate private equity firm. Maybe you could talk to us about your start in working for that firm, because I believe if I had this right, you actually approached the principal and you asked to work for, for that firm. Is that correct? Well, so it's interesting when, when you're listening to a bunch of podcasts, you, you learn about different, different, um, like different ways to approach the real estate industry. And there's so many different ways. And, and some people you just really resonate with. So I have a technical background. My, the firm I worked for had a very methodical uh, data-driven approach. And so once I heard that, and this was probably 2018, I, I realized that this, you know, they're presenting in meetups around the Bay Area. I live in Sacramento. So I started driving you know, because I was already driving for work, I started driving, you know, one or two times a week, never more than that, um, to these meetups and really getting my face in front. And then I realized how unorganized and how, um, what's, what's the word when there's a, like the critical, the critical point in the, in the, in the process that can't continue to grow because of that, because there's that constraint. Broken. That, yeah. Like bottleneck or uh, there was a, there was a bottleneck in the system where the principal had to talk to all the investors. So I thought, okay, well, I have a sales background. At that point I had eight, eight years or seven years, hundred percent commission background. You know, how can I free up this person's time so that they could focus on higher value add act business activities. And so I started thinking of processes and, and ways that I can, I can basically wedge my way into the company uh, I co-hosted a real estate meetup in Sacramento uh, called the Real Estate Roundtable. Um, I would present before this person came, and uh, the head of their their growth hacking, Eric Blue, a really good friend of mine, and I still talk. And uh, we're actually going to a conference next week for um, growth hacking strategies, which I think is really important. You know, 
syndication is essentially a, it's a, a marketing company with a real estate platform. And then there's obviously the, the operations that are really important. But the whole point is, you're right, I wedged my way into this company to allow people to focus on increasing their deal velocity so that I could handle the investor relations because that's my skill set is creating empathy and, and making sure that people are making decisions based on the right assumptions and learning how they're receiving information. Yeah, and we can't wait to get into that because of you know your 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 experience and talking with thousands of investors. So we, we we you know actually we have kind of an alternative motive to get you on the show was for us <laughs> to learn how to manage our investor relations because of all the experience you have. And some things are just like we believe that are in your in your mind in your brain automatic because you just did it for so long. You might not come out and say, hey, this is the best practice, but it's just something that you've normally done for such a long time. So that kind of gets us to the. Next question here, if you like. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So Colin was working for this large firm. He was talking to hundreds or I'd say, yeah, thousands, yeah, thousands, <laughs> thousands, thousands of investors. For sure. And, yes. and I've also been on hundreds of calls over the last couple of years, right? So I've heard, I firsthand like have the understanding of how difficult some of the investor questions can be. So Colin, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, if you didn't know the answer to some of the hard questions coming your way, what was the process in responding? Well, I mean, obviously there's the, there's the generic go-to response where you go, oh, that's a great question. Let me get back to you with an answer. I'll, I can talk to the firm yeah. um, and, and, you know, talk to the appropriate person, get back to you. Um, that's kind of like the go-to one. You never want to BS. One of the things about sales is you never want to lie. You can withhold information, but you never want to lie because then you have to remember that lie. And then when you're on so many calls, you have lies stacking up. And um, so the answer is I, I spoke to 3,819 investors while I was there or 3,819 wow. calls. The reason I know that is every single call was documented. You know, they'd come in, I'd have a set right. um, agenda. I'd have an upfront contract and we could talk about this. But um, I think it was really only the first six months that I didn't know the response because I was learning the, the product and the operations of our company. And then once I was familiar with our underwriting system, once I was familiar with our execution and our asset management, it was a lot easier, but I would never ever BS an investor. And, and truthfully, it's an, almost an excuse to come back to them and, and touch them again. Yes, absolutely. Yes, Touching absolutely. Points. I think that the, the issue here with Ava is because Ava is part of leadership. She's a CEO of the company and it's very hard to, uh, you know, to say, hey, I'll get back to you on that because there's a lot of, you know. Yeah, yeah, so it's, yeah, I'm like right away I, going to get the, yeah. And with us is also cross-border taxation yes. because we service Canadian investors and U.S. investors. So at times there are some sophisticated <laughs> questions that are being asked. But on the operational side, that's for sure. Like sometimes some questions we need to ask our, um, you know, our operating team, yeah. our asset manager about. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's it's some um, hurdles that you've face as well and Absolutely. asking questions from from investors and you learn a lot you learn a lot as they i'm like ask more questions because i you know you learn along the way and as what, well, which is really fantastic what, what also what else we also did is we created an faq questionnaire so yes. anytime it, there's a question posed to both of us and we don't know the answer to that that we have to get back to an investor we go and put it into the faq no Absolutely. matter what even if we we think we memorize the question it goes into the faq yeah. for us it, yeah it's it's funny you say that because we did have a slack channel for that um so but also i want to say that when, when you're thinking about investor relations and interfacing with an investor, typically you lose 10% decision-making influence for every month. You don't touch them. So that could be an email, but it has to be something of value. Yeah. And so when you, when you go back, back to them with that answer of the question you didn't know, that, that's, that's just an opportunity for you to continue to, to kick that influence factor that you have down the road. So right absolutely. on now with your 3,800 calls and then some, how, what was the average time you spent on each call? Well, so I would always want to establish up front that, you know, this is a, this is a 30 minute call. Um, and the reason for that is I don't want people to think they're going to get locked into an hour long sales pitch. Mm -hmm. Even if the call is going well, if you don't cut it off and make them understand that you have a call scheduled right after, they're not going to value your time. And sometimes it's hard because you can jive really well. And so I would always say, hey, I encourage you to set up another call or here's my here's my cell phone number because I'd always call direct from my cell phone yep. and say, text me or reach out to me, or let's talk three hours from now. Like if, if, if you could just tell that this was a, a very motivated investor and they were going to move forward, it's still important for you to cut the call off and, and reach out to them later that day, because that creates a pendulum of emotion. And the ebb and flow is when you really can uh, create, um, 
create the motivation for an investor to take change. And you have to think about it. We're trying to get people to, to invest in a real estate project with us and nobody's going to do ch any change. No one's ever going to make any change unless the pain they're experience, experiencing today is great enough for them to make that change, is great enough for them to want to make a decision. And so people, you know, I, people invest emotionally, but they logically and intellectually kind of qualify it and, and uh, validate that decision in their mind. So um, they invest emotionally, but they decide logically, I forget the term, but yeah, it's, no. it's really important for you to cut that call off. So the, the answer to your question is, is 30 minutes. 30 um, minutes. Yeah. But there could be the same person that I might have the same phone call with later that day. But just from a psychological perspective, I want them to want me. I want them to know that when they come to me, they're going to get value in the conversation. So they're, you know, if you go longer than 30 minutes, they better be, they better be buying, you know, you know, they better be moving forward. Otherwise I need them to continue to want me. So. Got it. And, and just a follow-up like question that. to that uh, uh, for, for you, Com, is now you, 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 do you feel like that when you have spoken to someone a, a, a couple of times, right? So you had, you know, you have that cutoff at 30 minutes, but then they ended up on a call with you again. Uh, would, would that higher the chances of them investing with you because now they've been on a couple of calls with you and they, 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 um, they've met you a bit farther created that more strength in that relationship. Right. So that's also yes. another thing. Yeah. So it really depends on the project. If the project doesn't align with their needs, I'm not pushing it on them because it's a waste of my time to try to, to try to create scarcity or FOMO for a particular project that won't be something they're happy with two years from now. And then also it depends on their liquidity needs. So if I'm having multiple conversations with somebody, I, I might know that they have an exit in October. Well, I might talk to them May, June, July. Uh, I've created very personal relationships. Um, one of the reasons I left that firm was because of a misalignment of values. Um, I really want to serve cardiologists. I've had four open heart surgeries, actually three open heart surgeries and a TAVR op operation. And so um, because of that, I've been able to create an unparalleled connection and empathy with medical field professionals, because I understand some of the individual challenges that they have. That goes into the fact that I'm talking to these people, not just to close, I'm talking to these people because it can become um, personal and emotional. I go bike riding with many of my investors that live in Northern California. Um, I've gone to fights and comedy clubs and, and stuff like that. So the answer to your question about do, are they more likely to invest? No, they're more likely to get clarity on what their needs are, and then they're probably more likely to make a decision quicker. Well said. Well said. Love that. I do love, love that. that. And we were going to ask if you're, you know, the people you talk to, your investors mm -hmm. have your personal phone number and if you connect with them on LinkedIn, but it definitely sounds like that is a yes. <laughs> um, awesome. Awesome. So Another thing I wanted to kind of talk about is, you know, most of these real estate private equity offerings are for accredited investors, right? So what, like, how do you approach when a non-accredited, how do you kind of deal with non-accredited investors wanting to get on a call with you, wanting to learn more, um, but they can't really, you know, partake in the offerings? Yeah. Do you take any steps and kind of saying, hey, these are, these are the basic kind of steps you need to take to become accredited, or do you just cut it off right away? Because just knowing you and knowing your personality, you're someone that just wants to continuously add value. And that's what we love about you. So yeah. what do you do in a case that you see someone so eager to invest, but they just can't they, they because can't, of their financial yeah. situation? Uh, they might even have the money to invest, but they just can't because of the restriction in the offering. Well, there's, there's a couple of things. Uh, I'd say there's three things. One, everybody's kind of selfish. So sometimes when I'm having these conversations and I know that they can't invest with me, I think about what can I learn from this call from them? And so just in that sense, I've learned so much about a variety of things I've never had exposure to. So one, what can I learn from the call? Two, how can I educate them and get them exposure to the right material so that they can take the right actions to become accredited in the future? And then three, I do have a Rolodex of syndicator friends that have 506B offerings that I always refer them to. Nice. Awesome. That's awesome. super Great. cool. Of course. <laughs> Educate, yeah, add value, yeah. assist, help others. I love it. Yes. Yeah. Do you keep track of your closing ratios? Like, do you, do you kind of keep track? Cause you talk to so many investors. You're like, okay, I talked to this many investors. This is how many I close. This is how many actually, you know what I mean? 
Do you got the numbers, the KPIs? <laughs> <laughs> I've never, I've never kept track of the closing ratios. Oh, I got a train coming by. I don't know if we want to pause it or if you can hear the train in the background, but no, that's all good. That's all good. It's yeah. good. So um, we haven't kept track of the cl closing ratios because sometimes I, I've personally had investors move forward eight times with me. Um, and I've also like, that's a guy who I've gone biking with, but um, you know, mo road biking, not cool motorcycling. <laughs> <laughs> you road bike and motorcycle. Super cool. Yeah, and motorcycle. <laughs> yeah, you see me in the tight spandex. So. Uh, <laughs> But I, what, what I have kept track of is the increase in the frequency that they're investing. I've kept track of the amount of investors. Um, what, what's happened is, so I worked at the large equity firm for uh, about three years, well, just under three years. And we noticed that um, when we have phone calls, the first thing I start with is, you know, how'd you hear about us? Because then I could have a, a conversation with the marketing team, give them feedback on, on better targeting Facebook ads, which as of lately, Facebook ads has been completely shut down. Uh, there's a lot of other things that were, that um, I'm personally looking into. Um, the second thing I've, I, I want to figure out is uh, what are what are they looking for? And and uh, truthfully, I lost my mind. I lost my uh, train Track. of thought because of, because of train. But, um, he lost his train of thought because of the train. Yeah, train. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But um, so so the. Uh, I, I guess the, the, the answer is, and I, you know, I, I truthfully, the train's really loud right now. It's hard to hear, um, no but we can, we can't hear it on this side. Yeah, so that's a great thing, but really yeah. that, that's pretty interesting. That's, yeah. that's impressive sound, sound technology. That's, that's what I was going to ask you. So when you get on, a, on, on all these calls, you're, you, while you're on the call, you're taking notes and now you, you're giving those notes to the marketing team, but also personally, do you keep notes? Like someone says, Hey, you know, Hey, how you doing? What's new and exciting in your life? They're like, yeah, I just had a baby daughter. Do you keep notes of that? So next time you potentially talk to this person saying, Hey, how is your daughter doing that? What that was recently born? Like, do you, does it go that detailed uh, when you talk about uh, uh, note taking? And what so, so there's, there's a form that I, I created and I filled out. It, it has so many different things um, that are, that are kind of like click toggle buttons that I would fill in, you know, where are they from? You know, are they accredited, not accredited? What's their, what's their net net worth? What's their ability to invest? Um, and there's different ways to get that information out. You know, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say, oh, so can you invest 200,000? What I might say is, you know, last year you invested in, you, it sounds like, you know, you're pretty, uh, you have a pretty good uh, syndication and business acumen. You probably invested in a few of these last year. What were some of those investments uh, last year? What did those look like? And, and they might, they might go, what? I didn't invest in those or, and that gives me an idea, an idea of, of their, their past investing experiences. But to answer your question about, do I take notes? I break it into three different sections. So the first thing is personal information, which would go into, you know, their kids. The second thing is the compelling events. Um, so, so that might be like, you know, for me personally, I have, I have to have a really scary heart surgery. Um, and, you know, I, I might be 50 when I have to have it. And so my compelling event is how do I set up a system of income stream so that if I can't work after the surgery, I'm set. Right. That's a very personal thing to me. That note right there would go into my compelling events section um, because I want to know what motivates me and what's going to influence the decision that an investor has. An another example of a compelling event might be that there's a, there's a couple and one of the partners is very uncomfortable with syndication. And so now I want to understand in my, my follow up calls or in that particular call. And again, it depends on. It depends on how I grade the investor too. And we could talk about that more, but um, in the future calls, I want to understand how is, how is their partner who's apprehensive, where are they getting their information? Because I can't control the information that they can get, but I could try to coach them, which is why we do all these webinars and stuff. I can try to coach them so that they understand how to receive that information. Because the last thing you want to happen is for an investor to make a decision based on inaccurate assumptions. And that happens a lot. It's con confirmation bias. There's motivated decision making. There's a, there's a lot of different decisions that are made, really preliminary. And um, an example of this is when an investor comes into a call and you go, "What are the returns?" And you're like, "Really? You want to know what the returns are? How about everything else about the deal? Because I promise you, a good deal can go bad with bad operators. So let's talk about how we're mitigating the risks and, and protecting, you know, downside protection." Yeah. Um, so 
how do you coach the investors? Because when they come into a call with you, they have two thirds of their mind made up. And so there's a really long winded way of, of answering your questions, but there's a toggle of information that has to do with, with their location, their investing ability. There's their personal information section, which is a complete section. There's their compelling events section, which is gonna basically influence and dictate how they might personally make a decision. I think, I, I hope I didn't flip, flip you off. No, that's fine. Uh, and then, and then the, the third section is, um, you know, what are their individual questions? Because mm. questions say a lot about people. Oh, wow. So you keep record of the questions each investor asked? Yeah, because what wow. happens is I might have a call with them four months from now. And that that question is a monkey's paw for the conversation. And what I mean is I'll set up a phone burner session. This investor has been identified as a high priority investor. Therefore, they're going in they're, they're Within our CRM, we're going to segment them differently. And then I'm going to set up a phone burner session or a ring central session where I'm just powering through. I don't have an offering, but again, I want to, I want to touch them once a month. Um, so I'm powering through these phone calls and every time I'm just adding value, you know? Um, and so um, the, when I, when I go through that section where I wrote the questions, yeah. that could be, that could be a way that I loop it in and make it seem like I'm not just calling for a call, but I'll spend a good, you know, 10, 15 seconds Oh, here's their question. How how does this uh, impact them in the in the following months? Because it's the you know it's the next month or or something. And I'll and I'll just say, you know, last time you last time you talked to me, you you talked about 1031. I follow up. I followed up with you and I sent you some information to to the Madison Specs guy. Did you get an opportunity to watch that video? Because I want to tell you that there's been some some tax policy changes potentially related to this. And if you don't know about that, I'll get you the latest information. It's it's all about adding value on an individual level, but then automating and reducing the amount of time that it takes to create something off the top of the head so, so that they feel like they're, they're getting their value at it, you know? Got it. Got it. So, so, you, so you're, getting, you're getting book calls, vetted calls that are coming in, book calls in your, in your calendar. You're having all these talks with investors, but then you, 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 you allocate some time to reach out to investors as well. Is that happening on a certain date for a certain slot or that's happening where you have some free time between your already booked calls more of the latter um let's say we're in a null period so so an example was there's a time last year where where we were transitioning we we had six value add projects in in loi you know we we were we were doing our due diligence and then the problem was it was in the middle of covid and so the t12s we didn't we didn't know if those were trustworthy, you know, because the instability of the future, how do we, how do you properly underwrite the rent during COVID? Cause we didn't know what was going to happen. This was early 2020. Right. So that was a transition period where we kind of pumped the brakes on all projects, but we didn't want the investors to forget about us. And in, in syndication, you, you have to, it's more of content marketing then top of mind. So top, an example of top of mind marketing might be like Coca-Cola content marketing is where, you know, yourself, you're putting out, and I love your guys's logo and, and all, all the, all the content that you do. I, I probably only follow maybe five syndicators and you're one of them, you know, the, the big yacht. I love it. So, um, but content marketing is where you're adding value. And so it, it got to a point where you can only talk about COVID so much. And so during that time period is when I was going through my previous investor calls, filling in. Oh, what is that? Is that <laughs> that's not me? Is that one of us? That's your that's your YouTube video on on the top of slam dunks of 2020. <laughs> oh my God! What was that all about? I'm so sorry. I thought that was your. I thought that was a, <laughs> my hands are up here. Yeah, but uh. All right, that's that's a blooper we're keeping. So keep going. I'm so sorry. That was a funny he starts dancing. <laughs> So, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Oh, Only no. the right, going. <laughs> if you haven't lost your track of thought, please keep going. Yeah. To, to answer your question, when we don't have a raise, we still want to add value. And, and truthfully, you have to think about the age of these investors. The average age of the investors I was speaking, speaking to, it was interesting, actually. Pre-COVID was 58. Yes. <laughs> um, Ava, Ava, please stay in character. <laughs> this is a very oh, serious real estate private equity. I can't, uh, you guys. Okay. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
but um, they're 58, right? That was the average age of the investors I was speaking with. And so these people don't necessarily want to read emails. Maybe they can't, they're having trouble seeing the screen and they would love phone calls. So oh, wow. yes, communicating in the, in the media that, that people prefer, you know, typically with the older investors, they prefer a phone call. Um, I would say for scaling, if you have a new project and you're doing Zoom calls, I would recommend doing group Zoom calls. If you have great familiarity with the underwriting and, and you can really speak well to the project. Otherwise, it might it might backfire on you if you have four people asking you questions at once and and you have the sheep like nature of investors. And it, you if you do a group call, they come out of it just all blown away or they or they come out of it I, like one time I I had this. I had this guy asked me a question if, if there was a, a second security gate on the back of these, uh, this project that we were doing in Austin. Okay. And I asked our principals, they didn't even know. And I had to talk to the, the construction manager and, um, and I, I kind of pushed back too. I said, well, help me understand how that impacts your decision-making uh, in regards to this investment. You know, if there's and this no- this is on a group call? This is on a group call? This okay. was on a group call, and, but- um, yeah, but that was one of those things where that guy goes, "Ha, I gotcha." And then I have I have to deal with this person that 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 thinks he's the hot shot. You know, it's like uh, older engineers are typically the hardest investors because they think they they can engineer stuff and do everything better on their own. So you have to be able to speak in a way that makes them understand it's not about leveraging your your brain power; it's about leveraging your time. Mm -hmm. And you talk about your team of asset managers, your team of underwriters, how it might take them three years to find a similar deal with the same returns and all this other stuff. But way off topic. But awesome. The, the, no, but very yeah. good points. With very the music. Point. And, and I can really, yeah, yeah. relate with you on those group calls. Yeah, definitely. Okay, awesome. Um, so I was, I was just wanted to share something just so everybody knows that's listening to this. Okay. August and Colm have a serious bromance with each other. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been, I've been experiencing this and it's like <laughs> Colm's, Colm's comment, co co always complimenting August on his different ties that he's wearing. <laughs> August is saying Colm looks like Chris Hemsworth all the time. <laughs> so they kind of have like this little yeah. uh, uh, kind of, it's kind of exciting to watch you guys because there's always <laughs> something new happening, talking about the beards and everything. But one thing I wanted to say about the two of you guys, you guys both have something in common and that's confidence and empathy for mm -hmm. people, okay? And talking about empathy, Colm, we were kind of discussing this a little bit earlier, but when we were doing research, of course, we, we kind of realized that you had some heart surgeries. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you, I think you mentioned four heart surgeries in the past. Yeah. Um, so and, we, and one coming up in the future, And one coming up in the future. So just talking about you as a, this resilient person, and so you have a lot of resilience and empathy within you. And we wanted to talk about kind of where that comes from. And maybe you can talk to us about how your empathy, you know, has been key to connecting with investors. On the emotional level. And yeah. on the emotional level, particularly. Mm, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I, I think that the fact that I so I actually read this book called uh, The Will to Change. And this was a this was kind of like my my changing point in my life. I didn't realize that I was holding and harboring so much anger. And you know, you have when you go through some when you go to the doctor and you know, you're a teenager, or you're a kid, or you're an early adult, you know, like I was in my 20s, and the doctor says says that you're gonna die, you know, you don't realize the PTSD that that you you actually have. You know, I spent years my good friends know that I like wake up in the middle of the night or I was going to die. Right. So that, that impacts the way that I would be impulsive with relationships and, and a lot of other things. Cause I, you know, I think I'm going to die. Well, I'm, I'm not unique in the sense that other people have had trauma. I'm not unique in the sense that other people have deep fears. And, and so when you're talking to investors, you want to really understand their pains and cause that's, what's going to motivate them to make the decision, make a change. So typically, this is during the discovery part, part of the call, when you're really trying to understand their empathy. If you haven't heard it, there's a, there's a book called, there's a book called um, You Can't Teach a Kid to Ride a Bike at a Seminar. It was, it was beaten into my brain at my first, my first job. And one of the key takeaways was the pain funnel, um, because that's what motivates people. And if you think of it, whether it's a tornado or a funnel, you, you have a lot of surface level problem, surface level pain. So an example might be for an investor, they might 
want more money, right? Um, and, but as you dive down, there's a business problem. So uh, a business problem might, might be, well, actually a surface problem might be there, the investment isn't going, they don't, they don't wanna invest in a, an investment that doesn't go well, right? And then a business problem would be that they are not gonna get the returns that they want from their investment. And so financially, they're not doing well um, uh, as a business. But then as you drive down this, this pain funnel, you get to the personal problems and, and the personal motivators. And that's what really drives and change people. So a personal thing for an investor, as we go from a surface to a, a business to a personal problem, might be that if they don't have the extra money, then they have to work twice as long as work, which means that's more time away from their kids. So understanding how medical professionals, in particular surgeons, they have two wives, right? So they have their work, which is their first wife, and then they have their actual wife, which is their second wife. And it's really difficult for, I think, surgeons in particular to be empathetic with their children when the craziest thing that can have with, happen with their kids is never going to be nearly as bad as what's going on in the operating room. And so there's a stoicism, there's this callousness that they build up and, and understanding that and getting them to, to maybe spend less time away from, from you know, the operating room so that they could be more empathetic with their kids and, and spend that time um, with their kids that might be a motivating factor for them to invest and start investing now and next year, or next month and, and continue to invest um, in something with somebody they trust. And so like really understanding their personal motivators is so important. And then also understanding their personal motivators is important because now you're not pushing crap uh, on investments and wasting both of your time. So um, just, just knowing you said, why, why am I able to connect with people empathetically? Uh, it, it really has to go back to knowing I'm not unique in the struggles. Everybody has has some deep rooted insecurities and some deep rooted um, pain and concerns. Like my my number one fear is is to have a child that had the same heart issues as me, right? But that's not related to syndications. But um, I've talked to some brain surgeons that their fear is that they're going to miss their 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 children's childhood because they, um, they're spending too much time in the operating room. And, and so how do I make it so that they can have a, a bunch of passive income streams to replace the amount of time that they're spending in the operating room? And that's what's really motivated me is to give back to the people that's given me a second chance at life. And that's, a, that's, like, that's not even related to money, which is so much stronger of a driving factor. For sure, for sure. And like my experience, just to add to that, is also my experience with you, Colm, is... Uh, you know, since the since, since the uh, kind of first time we got acquainted, uh, there there's no really soliciting that was going back between us. It was just a connection and kind of learning more about each other. But I felt that connection with you right away, and it was it was because you came into the situation, uh, you know, uh, with with empathy. You came into the situation adding value. You came to the situation with uh, open heart, and uh, you know you know what I'm saying. Uh, just to use uh, you know you use an al analogy here uh, related to our topic. But yeah, that that's how I felt connected with you. Ava talks about our, 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 our bromance. Now, if, if that connection can be created with any investor relations person and an investor, the odds of that person investing is huge. I mean, as, as long as what they believe in, what they're selling, as long as the product is the right product, obviously there's risk associated with any investment, but as long as they're coming into it, knowing that their first focus is capital preservation, not to lose their investors' money, and their second focus is capital growth, and then they, they, they check off all these other uh, points there is a perfect marriage, but amazing. So yeah, that's um, really great. Colm. Let's move on to uh, just our last question before we move on to the next segment so, of our show. Yeah, which I'm Please. really excited about to do that with Colm. So here's our here's our kind of our last question here. What advice do you have to a passive investor looking to start investing in real estate private equity? So the college I went to, their motto was "Learn by doing." I I think that they should do two things. The first thing is is read a couple books related related to passive investing so i mean the, the go-to book i think right now is is probably brian burke uh the hands-off investor okay. really fantastic book i've actually so one of the ways you can build credibility with your investors is by by um 
obviously educating them, but encouraging them to go to to different syndicators and, and look at their deals. But you need to make sure that they're they're evaluating the information correctly. And in this book written by Brian Burke, uh, the Hands Off Investor, it kind of teaches you the questions to ask and how to spot the BS that certain syndicators do, and and the information um, that could be that could be um, um, altered within a spreadsheet because garbage in garbage out in the spreadsheet. So the, the first thing is, is probably educate yourself. Um, that book's a good start. The second thing is really pretend like you're investing in the deals. And so it's silly to say, cause I don't know everybody's time constraints. You can't really do an hour a day. Maybe I don't, you have kids or some stuff like that, but, but if you can just look at one deal a week and, and pester the, the investor relations person and ask them thought provoking questions that are related to your true concerns. If you can just do one deal a week, start there and keep it simple. You know, I don't want to say a bunch of things. I, would, I just want to say, read that one book by Brian Burke and evaluate one deal a week. Nice. Yes. Great advice. Oh, absolutely. Amazing. All right. Awesome. Next segment <laughs> of our club. show. Okay, we've come uh, the 10 championship rounds to financial freedom. <laughs> no music for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so whatever comes off of mind, we're really looking forward to hearing your, your responses, but I'm going to get started here on the first question. Who was the most influential person in your life? I mean, besides my dad, oh man. Oh man, that's, a, I, I need more specifics, but I, I mean, definitely my dad, I, even when I get in an argument with my girlfriend, I sometimes hear my dad and I go, Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, I can't, I don't know, man, influential in my life. There's so many different people. I, I would, I would say from a sales perspective, my first boss, Dale White at train train is, uh, one of the leading manufacturers in, in HVAC, uh, and uh, there's another train. Quinn, this is, do you hear the train? No, I don't hear. Okay. okay. Uh, so I live, I, I live by the, uh, by the intersection has 98% of the, the, the traffic in Northern California is, is about, you know, 400 yards from my house. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. It's crazy how we can't hear the train. It's a great mic. I heard, I heard it briefly before, but I can't hear it now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's a, it's a big boy. It's a big boy. So, uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, I'd, I'd probably say my dad and probably my first boss, Dale White. Awesome. Right awesome. He, the reason is he really, really just slammed into my brain the, the, the thoughts and concepts from you can't teach a kid to ride a bike at a seminar, which talks about customer facing um, in, interface. Um, I'm, I'm looking at my bookshelf to see if I could see the, the, what the book cover looks like, but let's go to the next question. Yes. Okay. Well, this is, oh, next question is actually, what is it? <laughs> what is the number one? What is the number one book you'd recommend? So you're looking at your books. Oh man. That's so funny. Um, the number one book I'd recommend it would, it obviously depend on the person, right? If, if it doesn't have to be a financing book, it anything, can be any book. Yeah, it's yeah. totally anything. up to you. Okay, so I have two books. The first one is The Will to Change. And this kind of goes, this is talking about, um, this is talking about feminine, feminist, uh, feminism traits in males, um, how the, the man has in the society has not been encouraged to become open and, and comfortable with their emotions and how that's directly impacted uh, their ability to be um, communicative about their, their heart and what, what their, their true feelings are. And so instead of asking yourself, why am I feeling this way? They might ask them, they might just project an attack. And I know, cause I've did 30 years of attacking, not, not physically, but, but you know what I mean? <laughs> so um, the first, the first book is the will to change. And then the second book I think is big magic. Um, oh yes. That's a really good one. That's yeah. A really so good book. yeah. And, um, and it's interesting with big magic. And I these books are free on the Libby app. If anybody wants to know uh, what the Libby app is, it's L I B B Y. You can reach okay. out to me. I can send you the the Goodreads or the Libby app links. Um, um, I don't have Audible. I have Libby. Libby has probably seven out of ten of the books out there. Oh wow! Um, 
look at that. Yes. Yeah. So, so I stopped paying for Audible here. This this right here is 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 worth the the worth the whole podcast, right? So absolutely. Um, free Lib audiobooks on the Libby app. It's connected to your local your local um, library. You're supposed to have a library card. You don't have to prove it yet because of COVID, but uh, download it for free. Li okay. Pick up Big Magic. Pick up The Will to Change. If you're a guy, The Will to Change would be super helpful. If you're a girl, then you can spy on the enemy. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Big Magic is really interesting because it talks yeah. about it talks about the fears that are unjust yes. and and how much how many how many different phobias people have that aren't really merited. Um, and it, and it talks about maybe if you have a passion, don't dive completely into your passion and and starve yourself work on your passion and then have your w2 pay for it until that passion can support you and there's other there's other key takeaways but the, it's interesting there's a lot of hoorah rah books that are super encouraging and and the the truth is this book presents all of the motivational ideas in a completely unique different way as mm -hmm. somebody that's probably read 50 different inspirational self-help books this book stands out Awesome. Thank you for that. Okay, right on. Next question, Colm. If you had the opportunity to travel back in time, what advice would you give your younger self? <laughs> I think there's a job that I wouldn't take. That's probably about it. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. yeah. And there's some other things, you know, like, uh, you know, I'm not religious, but God gave you your two ears and one mouth. Yeah. And so kind of use them in that order. Um, I, I, I was a fighter growing up and I think, I think I, I wish I would have recognized earlier on that I was more like, you know, you have this, uh, I love my dad incredibly, but there's, there's so many, like my dad's from the projects and there's so many really good values that come from hardworking. And, um, but also there's some, there's some things that I, I don't want to do to my, my kids and, there's some things that I, I don't want to do to my lovers and my partners and, and my, you know, I'd, I think if, if I would have told myself when I was 25, Hey, you're turning into your dad. Uh, I think that would have been a good tip to go, wow, let me leverage the, the incredible things about my dad. Cause if I'm half the man that my dad is, I'm going to be incredible. Um, but just knowing how I respond to certain things and, and recognizing that, wow, you're responding in a way that you didn't like when you're little. So right. it's, it's, I think that's the number one thing is just know that, that you learn how to behave from what you see growing up right. and, and you have to break that cycle sometimes. Uh, so Got it. Got it. amazing. All right, Colm, what is the best investment you've ever made? I mean, fortuitous timing with my first, my first rental, uh, <laughs> um, the best investment I ever made was probably working really hard to, to go back to college. Not that college is, yeah, not that college is really important uh, from a, a getting a job perspective, but college taught me how to learn. And then I carried that through to my, my following jobs and stuff. So I think the best investment I ever made was, was um, definitely going to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and, and meeting friends that are, have created, you know, I've only been out of college for 10 years, but I, yeah, for 10 years, but I, I think, uh, yeah, I'm getting old. I went, I went there the other day and I was just, I was just thinking like these, these freshmen were born when I was a freshman. <laughs> so, but, yeah. But college, because it, it taught me how to learn. Yeah. That's really great. I like that. Okay. Now what's the worst investment you've ever made and what lessons did you learn from it? The worst investment I ever made was was not even related to real estate, but I thought I was going to flip cars in my early twenties, and I signed up for this this automated car flipping uh, service that uh, you know they would send me like the auction car stuff, and I totally forgot about it because I was a spaz. And next thing I know, six months later, I had all these charges on my credit card. But you should probably just edit this out. <laughs> yeah. I would just try to, that's too funny. Okay, well, here's the next question. How much would you need in the bank to retire today? What's your number? I think 10 million. I've thought about that number and that's based on a return that I would invest. So um, 
Nice. 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 Good answer. Um, Next question. If you had, if you could have dinner with someone either dead or alive, who would it be? Oh man, there's probably Genghis Khan or Napoleon Bonaparte. Okay. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Stalin. Don't forget about him. (laughs) (laughs) Um, My, well, my, my mom's side is white Russian, so they were fleeting from all that. Yes. So the, you know, the red Russians and the white Russians, when my mom's side was on the white side. So, um, or the, the Bolsheviks or whatever that was, I forget. I forget. Bolshevi- Bolsheviks Bolshe- are the Bolsheviks. They're, the, they're, they're, they're the, definitely the red. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They were not the Bolsheviks. Yes, they were so, not. Um, I, I think that one person that I, I continue to be, to be inspired by is, is the rise. You know, you, you talk about, you talk about these people that are, disruptors of history and often people want to talk about alexander the great but really he kind of he kind of inherited philip ii's army and so i think really um philip ii was was more impactful and alexander the great had an incredible focus on conquering and he's kind of you know unidimensional so i wouldn't say alexander the great but i chinggis khan probably just because his rise when he was born he was timogen his father was a local tribe leader and uh, he was killed. And so Genghis Khan and his brothers and sisters and his mom basically had to fend for themselves when everybody else in that clan uh, turned their back on them. And if you know anything about the weather in Mongolia, it can be up to 70 degrees, uh, ne- negative 70 degrees. And so it's uh, the, the brutality of the weather. Those people have to have incredible resolve in order to survive. Yes. And I would, I would just want to know, learn his perspective and maybe even Kublai Khan, because his grandson was the first to, to actually be for the purposes of control. His grandson was the first to actually be accepting of, of all of the different religions and stuff. Uh, I don't know. That's, I don't know. There's so many good yeah. historical characters. Um, sure. I, the Archimedean, Archimedean empire, really good. Oh, August. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I think, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's some great kings there. Yeah, uh, there's some great kings. I, I Cyrus, think Cyrus, yeah. Cyrus the Great, man. Yeah, yeah, he's a good one. Yeah. All awesome. right. All awesome. right. Too many answers. I'm sorry. No, no, no that's hard. okay. That's okay. That's great. Um, if you now, next question, if you weren't doing what you're doing today, what would you be doing now? I'd probably be pretty sad. Truthfully, I would be, I'd probably be doing the same job that I was doing before. Um, one of the reasons I got away from my job is you, you got paid really well, but it was, a, it was because it was a bad job. It was constantly um, conflict, conflict resolution, dealing with uh, customers and stuff. And I have a friend, he's made like 500K the last, 500, last five or six years in a row, and he hates his job. And he's got three kids. I'm going to send him this episode. He's got three kids. And he's just so tired of it and he wants to get out of it. And so, you know, 500 K you go, wow, that's an incredible amount of money, but not if you're happy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, um, so I'd probably be doing that job because I hadn't had the courage to walk away from it because I was getting paid really well. And I was able to sustain a lifestyle that would be really fun, but deep down inside, it would be a struggle. Yeah. Well, let, let me ask you that question in a different way. What if you you had you could choose any option you wanted? Uh, I think Dr. Tom Burns, for example, said he would be a hunter, like an actual hunter. Like if you mm-hmm. could pick and choose any job out there, uh, like a race car driver or a professional athlete or some something. Yeah. That, what would what, I mean, this is just out of my curiosity. I've never asked this before. But if you could do something else in the world, what would you be yeah. what would you be doing? I mean, other than a professional footballer, I, you know, soccer player. Um, I would probably want to do this job truthfully. I mean, this is my opportunity to really help the cardiologists that have saved my life. So wow, I, cool. I, yeah, I get to, I mean, I'm chatty catty over here. So <laughs> <laughs> chatty catty. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry, okay, next question. Um, book smarts or street smarts? Obviously street smarts. <laughs> All right. All yeah. right. All right. Nice. Last question, Colm K. If you had a million dollars cash and you had to make one investment today, what would it be? 100% go to CBI. 
Oh, nice. <laughs> woo, woo, woo. <laughs> that's, awesome. That's awesome. why you're our favorite person. <laughs> hey, man, we love, we love that. We really appreciate all the wisdom that you bestowed upon us. Yeah, and thank you. Um, we're sure that, you know, just like usual, you add value. You added a lot of value value in, these, in this show this is a by great being episode, transparent yeah. and being open and uh, sharing us your journey. But yeah, please. Again, I'm going to have to go back and listen to this one. That's yes. how much I really like this episode. Absolutely. Um, Colm, maybe you can just quickly let everybody know what's the best way that people can reach you. Uh, well, first off, I mean, we really didn't get to dive into sales or investor tactics. So if you wanted to do a round two in the future on specific, specific sales automations and how to how to become an omnipotent work god, leveraging virtual assistants and wow. technology, that's something that we should do. Um, but the best way to reach me, probably my email, it's colm at tgaip.com. Um, uh, my goal is to serve as cardiologists. My goal is to serve as medical prof field professionals. And um, and if I could just get hyper focused on on helping the people that have helped me, that would that would make me really happy. Awesome. Awesome, Colm. Really Thanks so much for coming man. today, being our guest. <laughs> Heck yeah. <laughs>